Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so incredibly honored to be featured as a keynote for the inaugural um, Learning 2.0 conference. This is a really, really exciting and I believe very important moment for all of us. And I'm especially thrilled to have such um, wonderful representation um, from around the world here, um, as we just saw a moment ago when you were all chiming in and sharing where you're from. Um, my name is Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I want to take just a moment to introduce myself for those of you who have no idea who I am. Um, I'm here to present today a, a presentation for you that I've put together titled, Can't You Just Lecture to Me? Strategies for Transforming Reluctant Learners When Teaching with Emerging Technologies. Um, and this presentation really comes out of really everything that I share uh, comes out of my own teaching. I have been a community college instructor since 1999, and I have taught both full-time and part-time, and um, I've taught face-to-face -face and online. Um, I love everything that I do in teaching. I consider myself a teacher at heart, uh, but I'm very passionate about understanding the student experience um, with regards to um, how to use technology effectively. So that really kind of shapes the way that I bring tools and technologies into my classes. I've also been through a huge transformation myself with Web 2.0 and social media tools. That's actually how Steve and I got to know each other years ago uh, when I stumbled upon Classroom 2.0 when it first emerged in its early months, perhaps, and um, Steve actually ended up being a neighbor of mine, and we ended up chatting at a nearby coffee shop. Um, but I was going through a phase of my life where I was actually recovering from um, a, a pretty serious open heart surgery, and it was Web 2.0 technologies that put me in touch with a community of learners around the world that got me through a time um, got me through a, a part of the learning experience that was quite emotional, um, connected that emotional learning element for me that I needed, but I didn't realize I needed. Um, and so I share all that with you just because I think it's important context, because it informs the way that I teach. Um, I'm a blogger. I blog at teachingwithoutwalls.com. I share everything, pretty much everything that I do on my blog. I'm also a social learning consultant for voicethread.com, and I um, hold a monthly webinar, and uh, we just started a Hangout series in Google Plus for educators who use VoiceThread. You can learn more about that on my blog. And I have just published my first book. It's coming out um, next week. It's titled Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies, and I'm going to be sharing a link with you in a little bit to a goodie bag, and you'll find a discount offer in that goodie bag um, for the book if you're interested in checking that out. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Thank you for sharing that link, Peggy, to my blog. Um, uh, thanks to our Learning 2.0 sponsors and supporters. Cannot forget about these fabulous supporters. And let's get started with Can't You Just Lecture to Me? Um, yeah, let's do that. So um, if someone else could help me out by typing that into the chat window, you're so resourceful, folks. I'd really appreciate that. And it'll flow much better because I have a hard time multitasking like that myself. Thanks very much. Um, there's just one C in the lecture component, le lecture word there though, but that is the, the, the correct link other than that, that typo in lecture. So what you're going to find if you go out to this link is um, I use a tool, a Web 2.0 tool. It's called Bag the Web, and it's a very, very simple tool. Basically, you create a bag. It's free. And once you create a bag, you give it a name, you can upload a graphic like I have done here, and you can add links into it. And I find that this is a fabulous way to just put, to, you know, you, oftentimes you have lots of links that you want to share with folks when you're giving a presentation or teaching a class and that sort of thing. And course management systems work great and websites work great, but, you know, sometimes when you're in environments like this, you just want a real simple link. So I use Bag the Web. 
Um, and then I just customize and shorten that URL using tiny.cc. So that's my, one of my little tips for you. But your goodie bag um, is available at the URL that you have just been provided with. So um, a lot of the resources I'm going to share with you are all accessible directly through that link to the goodie bag. I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask just to understand who you are all. Um, first of all, which of the following best describes you? If you could, let's see, select, let's see if I've done that right. You should see options at the top of the participant screen um, above all the names. You should see options for A, B, C, D, and E. And if you could select the response that best describes you, that would be fabulous. Did I describe that correctly, Steve? I think you did, yes. OK. <laughs> this, this was the part I, I was challenged with in our training, so I want to be sure. OK, I'm going to give you another five seconds just to go ahead and um, wrap that up. And I'm going to publish those results, three, two, one and see where everyone's at here. OK, so about 39% of you are in a teaching role. 4% of you are administrators. 12% of you are instructional designers or support staff. 14% of you fall into the other category. And some of you didn't get to chime in. I'm sorry if I went too fast there for you. Hopefully this next one. Um, You'll be able to jump in. And what about your institution type? Oop, I was supposed to clear that. Let's see if that works. Give you about five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. We'll see how that turned out there. OK, so it looks like according to this, I still had about a third of you that didn't chime in. Um, we've got about 22% of you K-12, about 26% B, which is higher ed. 6% corporate and 14% um, self-employed. And OK, great. So I am, um, well, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. So one more question. If you are in a teaching role, and so now we know that I think, I think we had about 30% of you in a teaching role, um, or maybe it was higher than that. I think it was actually 40-something percent. Or ever have been, have you experienced students who have been reluctant to engage in new pedagogical approaches? If you can, and let me change that response there for you. Oh, someone already did that for me. Thank you. OK, and I'm going to give you the five second countdown. Looks like things are slowing down. Five, four, three, two, one. And I will show you those responses. We have 46% of folks who said yes, and 12% of folks who said no. And of course, many of you are not in an instructional role. So um, you know, this is really kind of part of the territory as we move forward with innovation. Um, this is, you know, our world is really saturated in this, this environment of learning 2.0, very participatory, uh, content creation, uh, you know, learning from one another. However, we're not all there, um, and we're not all there within education. And I think that this is really kind of part of the struggle today, part of the challenges. Um, even when you are a, a, an educator who's 
deeply entrenched, and I consider myself who's, you know, very involved with participation and um, outside of teaching and has really thoughtfully woven in participatory learning into my, um, the pedagogy that I use in my classroom. And I do have my students use Web 2.0 tools outside of the course management system. So in higher education, um, within the institutions where I teach in the US, it's very typical for an instructor, when you teach an online class, you're provided with a course management system, Blackboard, Moodle, Desire to Learn, Canvas, et cetera. And then you use the tools in that course management system. And if you wish, you essentially begin to enhance that toolkit with tools from outside the learning environment. And that's something that I do quite a bit. Now the problem, or one of the problems with that, is that a lot of times our students aren't there. Not only outside, maybe they are out, are there outside, they're in their informal learning, but when they come to college, they still anticipate that college is something more like a learning 1.0 environment, right? They still expect to come into a classroom or take an online class that is really still driven by this kind of transfer-based information process. Um, and so that's something that we, we struggle with. We have to think about this. I think about it a lot as a cultural shift. And sometimes I may be over on the right side of the spectrum, but my students may expect me to be over at the left. And so that's really part of what this presentation is all about, how to negotiate these challenges. So while you're looking out at this beautiful image for just a moment, I want you to imagine. We're going to clear our minds. Okay, and I'm going to have you pretend that you are a student. And I'm going to actually turn my video off so that you can't see me um, because I want you to really imagine. I want you to take a few moments to just picture for a moment that you are a college student. And today is the first day of the semester. And for many people, that's actually true. You are attending a community college and you have the goal of obtaining an AA degree to transfer to a four-year university within the next year. You're 48 years old. In addition to attending college, you're also working 25 hours a week in a customer service call center, and you have three kids ages 10, 12, and 16. Your 10-year-old son is disabled and will be having surgery four weeks into the semester. And this event is causing a great deal of stress on you and your family. Now, when it comes to using technology, you use email very heavily. And you have a cell phone, and you text message with your kids, but you don't have a smartphone, and you have no interest in getting one. You have a Facebook account, but really just use it to monitor what your oldest son is up to these days. You have no interest in using social media more because you just don't have the time to weave it into your busy life. This semester, the one that's starting right now, you're enrolled in three classes. Two of them are online, and one of them is on campus. And this allows you to, to weave your learning into your busy schedule. You've taken at least five online classes previously, and you understand what they're like. You know what to expect. You log into a course management system. You review your weekly assignments. You do some reading respond to a discussion prompt or two each week, reply to your peers' posts, and then take a couple of exams throughout the semester, and maybe do a group project or write a paper. Well, this semester, after reading the syllabi for your two online classes, it's apparent to you that one of them is very, very different. It uses the same course management system and has a syllabus just like the other classes, but it requires students to create accounts for two external web-based tools. One of these tools is called Ning, something that you've never heard of. Your instructor describes Ning as a social network, a private social network, in which we're all going to be sharing and learning together. You understand that you will need to create your own blog in Ning, write regular blog, to, blog posts about the content in the class, comment on, each, on your peers' work, and share photographs and videos related to the history of photography, which is what the class is about, by the way. Now, the other tool that you're going to be using outside the course management system is a tool called VoiceThread. And this instructor is actually going to require you to participate in your class discussions and activities using voice or video comments. You, can, you actually have choices here. You can choose between using a microphone on your computer, a webcam. 
You can use an iPhone or an iPad if you have one, or you can comment with your telephone. You don't need to identify which method you'll be using. I'm sorry, you will need to identify which method you'll be using to leave those comments by the end of the first week. You feel frustrated and completely overwhelmed, you're seriously considering dropping the class. You notice that your instructor wants students to review a resource at this point, a resource that is called the Wisdom Wall. Now, folks, I'm going to take you out to a web tour. And I'm going to play an excerpt of the Wisdom Wall, and this is a real thing that I share with my students in my own online class. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm the crazy instructor that's having your students do all this stuff. So this should open up on your page, and I'm going to let you take three minutes to listen to it. Okay, hope you're all back with me here. Now, I didn't say this, but I hope you caught on to the fact that those were voices of past students who had taken the class. And what I'd like to do now is invite you all 
to kind of regroup and imagine that you are that same student. And now reflect with me what aspect of listening to that wisdom wall helped you feel better about your anxieties. And this is a whiteboard where you can um, type on the board. To do that, what you're going to want to do is look over at the tools that appear running up and down along the left side of the whiteboard and click on the A and then select the big A and you should be able to just type right on the screen. Okay, while you're wrapping up here, I'm just going to start reading some of these because they're great and I'm already seeing a lot of um, similar trends here. It was nice to know that others have the same feelings I have. Um, uh, everyone feels kind of similar. Um, there's help available. It was reassuring. It was insightful. Knowing that others were success successful. There's light at the end of the tunnel. It was calming. It's normal to feel intimidated. Knowing that there would be lots of support from the teacher. Being reassured that everything in the course is doable. The online space was humanized, made me feel a little at ease. Don't be afraid of the knowledge of the students. I'm not alone. It's reassuring to hear that they completed the course even though they were scared at first. I felt like I could connect with people that I may never meet, hearing my peers, I'm not the only one who may have been frustrated. So all of these things that you mentioned um, are all things that I applaud and I completely agree with. Um, these are all elements that are so critical to forming these early threads of community. And what you're really touching on is that hum humanization element of that online space. Um, and when students are coming into a new online class, many of them are nervous and incredibly intimidated. Um, and that's something that I find. And the more I open up this first week, this first opening part of my class and give them the opportunities to reach out and share with me how they're feeling, the more in tune with this I'm becoming. And it's, it's incredibly fascinating and it's really making me realize how critical it is for us as teachers to be supporting that part of their learning, particularly in the online space. But the same is true in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, so a lot of this comes down to breaking down particularly that very rigid hierarchy in um, really, and I, th I think it's, it's really true in a college class that exists. Uh, we go back to learning 1.0. The tradition is for the students to sit there and be quiet and not talk until they're told to speak. And so breaking down that hierarchy between professor and student, instructor and student, and really becoming a member of the community is really, really important. But I also have to say that um, I see a huge shift with introducing the voices of my students to my new students. Um, I used to do this activity with text, and it works well. It works OK. But I think um, it works better when when they can hear the voices. So thank you for participating there. Um, I hope that was a good kind of introduction to where we are. And again, just a reminder of that graphic that has been very formative for me with this, with this concept. So Learning 2.0 is teaching with emerging technologies. You're teaching with this toolkit. Um, 
of, 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 of technologies that are new and emerging. Many of them fall into the categories that we're now referring to as social media, Web 2.0. And um, when I think about teaching with emerging technologies, um, pedagogy really drives those choices, right? When you're bringing in a tool, you really have to have your arms clearly wrapped around why you're using that tool, how that tool supports your learning objectives. Now that's kind of something that's just implicit throughout this entire presentation. I'm not going to get into that, but I just want to say that that's, you know, obviously fundamental to effective teaching with emerging technologies. Another element, of course, is the mechanics, so how to use the tool. And that's true for you as the instructor. We all know that when you start using a tool, there's a, there's a, there's a learning curve. Well, the same is true for your students as well, right? And we have to remember that. But then there's this third component that I'm really going to be focusing on here today, and I call it student success. And it really has to do with getting to know how your students are feeling, discovering what it is that they're going through, and being there for them. And this is paramount to me in the first week or two of the, um, of the class. It's absolutely paramount. Um, and I don't know if, Steve, if you want to maybe take off some of those controls for the whiteboard um, before people start drawing mustaches on me and stuff, that might be cool. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that, um, again, it's this, this last bubble that we're going to be stressing today and getting into some of those fundamental elements of student success. For me, one of the golden rules um, when it comes to teaching with emerging technologies is this, and this is just a quote that I find myself saying over and over again when I do faculty presentations, if you don't believe that your students can do it, you're right. Um, and I hear so frequently from instructors when they're introduced to a new technology, they, they say, my students could never do that. And, and I look at them and I say, you're right, they couldn't because you are their leader and you have to really have confidence and believe that your students are capable and if you don't, they are going to know that. It's going to be clear to them um, that believing in your students is something that will come through in everything that you do in your class. It comes through in your attitude. It comes through in every every sense of it. It gets exuded in everything that is is put together in your entire class. And so I think that that is just kind of the cardinal rule to keep in mind. So moving forward, we're going to take a look at a few things. First of all, the concept of building community, and then the pillars of privacy, access, scaffolding, and feedback that are all really essential to student success. So let's go ahead and get started with community. When I put together a class, um, I've found that the more I start using uh, Web 2.0 tools, social media tools outside of my course management system, it's really critical for me, it, it has been really critical for me to define for myself what I mean by community. Because I am teaching now in an environment that is like a community. And I know that, and that's my expectation for my class, but what is critical is for me to be able to define what that means and to communicate it to my students up front. So this now becomes part of my syllabus. It becomes part of the very initial conversation about the class. So the, the students know right from the start that it's going to be different. So you need to articulate and also model. It's, and again, it's, um, it's easy to come up with this great philosophy about what community is, and then it just kind of falls off. It's about modeling it every single step of the way in all of your activities. So then you're going to find that your activities really need to align with what it is that your community model looks like. So what I find is help, uh, helpful, I've put together um, some tips for teaching with social media, and this is one of the PDFs that you're going to find in the goodie bag. So you don't actually need to have this link here. Um, this is the direct link to that PDF, but just remember that's why I gave you the goodie bag link at the beginning, because all these links are in there. So this is the community ground rules PDF, and um, it's just kind of a helpful overview about what community ground rules are, why they're important. And um, it's got some sample ground rules in, in there. For me, there's four different elements 
that would go into my community ground rules. I'd want to define what a community is. I'd want to come up with lists um, for my students for them to read and become aware of you know, what it is that they're supposed to do as a community member. And they're going to agree to those things to become a member of the class. And also additional ground rules. I think that's a great place for you to put a link to your institutional student code of conduct. Uh, you know, weave that in so it becomes part of, of, of what your students are, the code of conduct that your students are bound to as students in of the institution. And make it clear what's going to happen if a member violates a ground rule. And so what I do there is essentially um, the verbiage that I use there, and you can see that in the PDF, um, is I basically make it clear to them that if someone violates the ground rule, they, that, that should be brought to the, atten the attention of the community leader, who is me, and I will deal with that in a one-on-one um, -on -one, um, manner. And I just want to take a look at the chat box. and. Steve, if you could prod me and let me know if there's any questions that I'm missing, that would be really helpful because it's hard for me to kind of keep my arms around a lot of the questions. I'm afraid I may have missed a couple things there, but please let me know if there's anything that I should be addressing in that chat box. Um, so going back to the, I just want to take a quick look at the, the, the handout here that you all have. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term etiquette. Uh, um, netiquette, I'm sorry, netiquette, which is a, a term that's been really f used very heavily for uh, for years in online teaching. And this is very much just a variation of netiquette. Uh, many of the rules that are listed under as a community member you agree to, if you read through them and if you're familiar with netiquette, they really seem very much like that. Um, so it's really about respect for one another, making contributions, again, breaking down that hierarchy and being sure that everyone understands that you are going to be expected to lean on one another and help one another through this experience and be respectful. And safety and trust is, um, is paramount to all of that, which ties us right into our next um, pillar of privacy. When students are in a community, what's central to participatory learning is obviously participation. And um, of course, when you're having your students participate, where they're participating is going to directly affect the nature of the conversation. And that's why this falls under this pillar of privacy. So you know, here we have this picture of these two people kind of casually having, it looks like a conversation in a, in a kind of a private space. And so you know, the conversation that they have there is going to be very different if it, than if it was you know, amongst a huge group of people. Um, and maybe there are strangers sitting around them, that conversation would change. And so when we think about pulling our students out and having them participate in open web-based tools, for example, like Twitter, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think there's fabulous ways to use Twitter in um, a class for learning. We need to be aware, first of all, ourselves as instructors, that that environment is public. And that needs to be communicated to our students. And that's something that I do not think is happening as clearly as it should be. It's really important for you as an instructor when you use a tool outside of the course management system that you are aware of the privacy options that it offers and that you are communicating to your students the privacy options that you are using within the course. So Twitter is something that is public. There are many other tools, for example, VoiceThread, the way I use it in my class is completely secure. So I tell my students that. And the way we use Ning is secure. So I tell my students that so that they know that they're, what they're sharing is only visible to the students in our class. Um, now, when we go out and if we were to do something public in a tool like Twitter, I would want them to be very aware of the fact that it's public. And a lot of times I think we have these assumptions as instructors in college that, oh, well, you know, most of my students are young and they're that generation, they all know this stuff, and that's, that's really not okay for us to do. It's really important for us to be communicating clearly and also modeling what's appropriate to post and what isn't appropriate to post because these are standards that are still being formed um, in mainstream society today. 
So when it comes to student privacy, I also have a, a, a PDF that I've put together. And um, I find that there are just some basic things that are really, really helpful. First of all, I've already said, understand the privacy options within a tool. Inform students about who will have access to their contributions. Provide that information up front, for example, in your syllabus, and then have your students agree to those conditions. And I'm going to show you how I do that with my students in just a moment. Also demonstrate the learning benefits. Now you've already seen how I do that in my class. That's, that's also another fabulous benefit of the wisdom wall. Because by listening to the wisdom wall, simultaneously the learning benefits of the tools are being communicated to these new students. And then finally, it is important to be offering options to students who, who really want different options. You are going to have students who have legitimate concerns, um, you know, particularly if you're having them work in an open web space. Um, uh, I had a student one year who was taking online classes because she had a restraining order against her husband. And she was very scared. She didn't want to leave her house. And so when it comes to participating online, we have to consider that. And we have to weave in and you know these options. Contact me if you have concerns. And then have these options in your back pocket. Don't put them out there for everyone. Um, you know, options do create more work for you as, as the instructor. That's absolutely true. But it's important to keep them available to the students who need them so that they can be supported with their learning and move forward with you know, a trustworthy environment. <clears throat> um, so these are the same tools or uh, tips that I'm reading. And I've just included the last few that fell off the page there. Number six, do not share grades. Uh, grades should always be shared in a secure environment, and that is uh, what course management systems are really good for. And um, stress the importance of logging out. You will find that a lot of students do use computer labs, and so when you're using social media, Web 2.0 tools, they need to understand how critical it is to log out of those accounts before they get up and leave that computer. Um, so that is a practice that we definitely want to be encouraging our students to implement. And when it comes down to those options, you know, they can be something as simple as if you don't want to share a picture of you for your avatar in this tool that we're using, you know, share a picture of, you know, your favorite historic landmark or something like that. Um, or just use your first name and last initial or create a pseudonym if that's something that is, you know, if there's there's a lot of concerns about using your name in a particular environment. Now, of course, pseudonyms are something that you're going to have to track on the other end so that you can actually ensure that they get credit for the work that they've done. And then this is how I uh, inform my students about who has access to their work. I create a chart just like this one, and I plug it right into my syllabus. So they have um, visibility at the very start of the class. Um, uh, they understand what tools we're going to be using. And I think it is important for us to be communicating this to students up front, because there are students who may come into a class and say, you know, this class isn't for me. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe there are students who want to make that choice. And I think that students should, should have that prerogative. And so when students come into a class and they look at a syllabus that looks just like every other syllabus, and then four weeks into a class, wham, bam, they get all these tools thrown at them, you know, we're not setting up the right expectations. And so I want my students to know right up front everything that it is that they're going to be using. Yeah, so Peggy, you, you're right. You're, you're mentioning that building community does get obscured a bit when the pseudonym issue becomes um, an element. And you're right. And that that's something that I would just have to accept if I had a student who had real privacy concerns. I don't think there's ever been a problem with using a first name and last initial with building community. Um, that's a standard that, I, that my students use. And there's always a picture. And they use first name and last initial. And it's really rare for me to have anything 
you know, more than one student in a class who has the same first name and last initial. So that works just fine in my classes. So moving on to access, number three. Um, so access comes down to just kind of stepping back at the beginning and asking some questions. Do my students have the required equipment that they need to use to be able to participate in these activities that I have set up for them? Are campus labs equipped to provide access to the tools? Um, you know, sometimes I've heard about instructors using technologies that are actually blocked in, in campus labs, and that's something that you'd want to consider, because a lot of times students do rely upon those labs to do their homework. Um, if you're having students, for example, use VoiceThread like I am, are they able to use a microphone in a lab and record? Or is there a specific lab on campus that they could do that at? Uh, those are things that you'd want to check into. Is there a mobile app that could augment student access? A lot of times, there's a lot of concerns about mobility using mobile apps because, um, you know, obviously not everyone has a smartphone at this point. Um, that percentage is growing. 47% of the adult U.S. population now has um, owns a smartphone, and that number is going up. Um, but at the same time, I think that thinking about mobile apps as tools that could augment what you're doing is a really cool thing. So maybe that's just a different way you could look at it. Do some, do some research and think about, understand whether or not that's, a, that's something you could encourage students to check out if they do have a smartphone. Um, is content accessible to all learners? And that's something to be considered as well. Uh, so if you have videos, are there um, options available for captions if someone does need those and so forth? So something that I do um, to, to work in supporting my student success in this early week is I have them complete a survey. Um, and the survey is completed week one. And I'm actually in the first week of my online class right now. So my students are completing uh, the survey. And uh, I do this to identify access gaps, to identify special accommodations, to evaluate student feelings and attitudes, and really to identify at-risk students. I find that this is a fabulous way for me to just provide them with an opportunity to send information, feedback, you know, exchanges to me. And it's also where they're going to agree to our community guidelines and um, the, the, the privacy um, information that they have now viewed in the syllabus. So this is what that looks like. Um, this is actually not the exact one that I use, but I have shared a, um, an adapted version of mine that I've called Teaching with Social Media Student Information Form. I use a form of Google Docs, which is actually Google Forms. And I have shared it as a template in their template gallery. Um, and if the link to this is also in the goodie bag. And if you actually post this in the, um, or if you go to this, you'll see a link at the top that says use as template. And you can adopt it as your own and make changes to it and use it if you so wish. Um, so Peggy, you're asking, uh, this one, I, you're asking if I use it as a pre-post or just at the beginning. This one I just do at the beginning, but I do have a, a, a very a different type of survey that I do at the end of the course every time. Uh, SurveyMonkey is another great tool to use for putting together um, surveys online. So um, here are a few of the questions that I've just excerpted out. I have read and agreed to the conditions of participation section in the course syllabus. So if anyone clicks no there, I follow up with them and I talk to them about their concerns. Um, I have read and agreed to abide to our community ground rules. Again, if you select no, I will contact you to discuss your concerns. So these are ways for me to identify students who are not OK with what we're doing. Um, and this works very, very well. And it's first week, so end of the first week, I've got my students identified who I need to follow up with. Now, another thing, as I mentioned, I require all my students to leave voice or video comments. So I ask them, um, I have access to a computer with a microphone or webcam that I can use for this class. Yes or no? Do you have access to an iPhone, iPad, or iPad Touch? Yes or no? Um, 
And then this question here, actually, I drill down to all the different options that you can use for commenting in a, a, a voice thread with voice or video. And if anyone selects this last option, I will use my phone to leave voice comments. I follow up with those students and I um, set them up with free phone commenting minutes, which is an option for anyone who has an institutional or department license to voice thread and it works fabulously. So that way it's how I fill in those gaps for the students who don't have access through one of the other three options. And um, one of the very last questions on the survey is, in one word, describe how you are feeling about this class. And I find that this is probably one of the most valuable questions that I ask on the whole survey. So do you folks know what Wordle is? Wordle, I assume you probably do. It's been around a while and it's very popular. Wordle allows you to create word clouds, which are beautiful, like, portraits of words, you enter in a bunch of text, and the more frequently a word is used, the bigger that word appears. So I have a Wordle put together here that shows the responses from my class from last spring. So by looking at this, you can see that most people were excited and intrigued. And then if I drill down to the smaller ones, there were a few that I was concerned about. I had a student who was nervous. I had a student who said everything is fine except the voice thread. And I had a student who was frustrated. So those were students who I followed up with and just kind of checked in. I said, OK, what's going on with the voice thread? And that student was having a problem with her microphone, which we resolved. Um, you know, the nervous was just, oh, I, you know, I just need some time to settle in. And again, we just, you know, I, again, it was a matter of me just saying, you know what, you're going to, it's going to be a bit overwhelming for the first couple weeks. Let me know by week three how you're feeling because I find that by week three, you know, they're really, students really hit their stride and things start to feel more normal. So hang in there, you're going to be okay. Um, the frustrated student, that student, do you remember the wisdom wall you listened to? That student was the one who left the second comment, who came in and said, don't be afraid of the technology. That student was a student in her late 40s who had taken many online classes and had never taken one like this one. And I followed up with her after I saw this response and I told her, I said, I want you to stay close to me through the semester. I want to know how you're doing. And I followed up with her again at the end of the semester. And, um, you know, I listened to her wisdom wall comment because I was really excited to hear what she was going to say. And I followed up with her through email too. And I said, so, you know, what was it that helped? And she really said, you know, just knowing that you were going to be responsive to my concerns was really all I needed. And so that's a really big takeaway. Now, when it comes to scaffolding, we're all educators, so I'm going to, you know, this is kind of going back to just kind of some classic learning theory here. Um, uh, when it comes to, to learning, you know, we want to think about students transitioning from one point to another, from their actual development point to their potential development point. And in that process, we, the instructor, fade out. And that's, that model there, when I think about that process of learning, that transition, that growth process that occurs with learning, helps me think about the process of scaffolding. And I translate that to um, my practices when I teach with technology. Um, because when I look at the way that I teach, I'm there really, really heavily with the students in those early weeks, helping them understand and really, I think, reaching out, listening, what's going on, you know, what do you need help with, I'm here for you. And a lot of times they don't come back to me with questions, they just need to know that I'm there. Um, they need to know that I'm responsive, they need to know that I'm not just an instructor who's going to push them out there and expect them to figure out everything on their own. But it is a real fading out process. And so when I also work in the activities in my classes, I think about the semester as also a process of scaffolding those, those tools 
So not only is the learning scaffolding in terms of meeting the learning outcomes in the course, which is normal for us as educators to think about, but also when it comes to using technology, you want to think about scaffolding the use of the technology as well. So I've just broken down some bullets here. In the early weeks, my students focus on creating their accounts, getting used to the tools. I all the stuff that we've talked about here, you know, they, they participate in a low risk activity that's also an icebreaker. This is a really tough time for students. Weeks three to four, I'm going to increase those ex expectations, start to foster some of our conversation norms, uh, be an active supporter and contributor. Students begin to feel confident in their tool use at this point, and the group norms really start to coalesce. And then as we move on from there, weeks five to eight, I begin to introduce more intermediate tool skills, group work, more collaboration. And then in that second half of the class is when we move into advanced application of tools. Students start creating content and so forth. Now, we get excited sometimes as instructors because we think, oh, we've got these young students who, you know, know all this stuff about technology. I'm just going to... We're, they're going to come in right off the bat and I'm going to have them create this, you know, really cool thing using this new tool. That might not be the best way to start off your class. Um, you know, I really think it's better to scaffold the use and to think about it, as Peggy says, the sequence of stages. Um, if you're interested in joining me again this Friday, I'm going to be sharing actually another session called um, How Learning how content and learning changes when students become the online teachers. And in that session, I'm going to showcase an activity that would be taken out of this week 9 to 17 chunk. I think it's about week 12 of my online class. And it's where my students are creating an entire module about mid 20th century photographers. And they're going out and using Google Books to do research. They're selecting the photographer they're going to do their research on. They're signing up for that photographer using a Google Doc. Um, after they've done their research and actually selected their own photographs using a Google image search, they're uploading them to, a, to our voice thread that they have editing permissions to. And they're presenting the content and creating their own discussion prompts and then re-engaging with each other's work. Um, and so that's something that I would never think to do at the beginning of a class but it goes incredibly well towards the end, and it's pretty amazing. So again, that kind of building the sequential steps um, and scaffolding, I find, is a really important part of student success when you're teaching with emerging technologies. And lastly, and I think that this has been an element throughout many things that you've seen me share here, we started with the wisdom wall and you saw the survey, which is an opportunity for students to share feedback. But I leave opportunities for feedback wherever I can. So um, again, VoiceThread is a tool that I have, um, I use, I think throughout a 17 week course, we have 15 voice threads that my students have to participate in their activities that I've created for them. I don't do this at the end of every voice thread, but I do it at the end of every voice thread in that beginning, say, the first five to six weeks of the class. I'm asking them to check in. I'm asking them how they're doing. I'm just giving them another opportunity. And again, most students don't leave a comment here. And you'll see that I made a note in the lower left corner this bubble in the lower left corner that commenting is optional and it's not for points, just good karma. Um, so it's, you know, doesn't fulfill their requirement, but it just gives them the option to share something about the class with me. And so I do this in a variety of different ways. I just kind of have this check-in page for them. And so I find that building in that opportunity for them to just kind of share and send feedback is, is really helpful for supporting their success. Um, this is um, just a quick look at a text version of the Wisdom Wall. Before I moved it over to VoiceThread, I used to do it in a simple Google Doc that students had editing permissions for. So they would just click on the link and it would open. Click on the link in the course management system, the Google Doc would open, and they would type right into it. And um, 
that works fine too, but you can't hear the voices. So it's kind of interesting that you've had that, that opportunity to compare. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'm wondering if there's any questions I should circle back to um, or if anyone has any you'd like to ask. Okay, let's see here. Michelle, I've been in and out uh, getting the other room set up, but I'm wondering if you posted that link um, recently for those who may have come in later, the, the link that has all of the goodies. I have not. I will grab that and repost it. If you could take a look at the, um, I'm wondering if anyone has a question they'd like to ask me. And help if you could help me with the voice, grant someone access to the mic if they want to ask a question. I can. If you have a question for Michelle, you can click on the hand icon. It's the third icon over in the participant window. And you can raise your hand and I'll give you the microphone. Or you can put a question in the chat, like Peggy put a question in. Do you find more students comment on the voice thread as the semester progresses? Um, well, what happens with the voice thread is that they're all required to comment. And this is actually, this is really fascinating little study I've done. Um, so I don't know if you're asking if they comment in voice as, as the semester progresses or if they all, they all have to comment. It's required that they then comment. Um, but, but what I have to see are only about voice. What I, what I found is I've been teaching with voice students since 2007, what I, and what I found, never, and I never turned the video back on. Yeah, let me do that. What I have, what I have found is that um, in general, 75% of students will only comment in, ta in text on the voice on the voice thread. Only 25% of them will comment, comment in blood. But, 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 but this past semester, I've been drawing so much so much on this, on this emotional element of learning. So what I did this past semester, and you saw all context. Hey, Michelle. Yeah, it's yeah. really hard to tell what you're saying. There's some kind of audio scramble. Uh, I don't think you've changed anything, but if you'd click your microphone off and then back on again, let's see if it comes through more clearly. Is that better, is that Steve? Better, Steve? No, Can something's happened to your audio, which is weird. Okay. There's an okay. echo going on. Okay. Um. We're lucky it happened at the end. I have no idea. It it was before you actually turned your video camera on, so I don't think it's related. But try turning your video off, and let's see if that makes a difference. Can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah. Now you're good. OK, I pulled my USB out and put it back in. Sometimes that happens with my audio, so maybe it's the same culprit. Um, so I'm going to keep talking, and if it gets weird again, let me know. But um, I think it was Peggy who asked that question. Peggy, what I found was that when I, this past semester, what I did was I required a voice or video comment the very first, well, it's actually the second week after they get their account set up. And what I found is that after I required everyone to do it once, and then the week after that, I assigned a voice thread and I said, comment however you want. And I left it optional, the choice optional after that for several weeks. And I checked in on the assessment with the percentage. Um, now, I mentioned that previous to this experiment, students would comment 75% of the time in text. And that was consistent over several years. Well, last semester, 75% of them were choosing the voice or video. And so what I find is that they're just so darn nervous about leaving that first voice or video comment. And when they don't do it, and then I, the folks who just are willing to step up and do it without being required are usually the ones who sound really good and eloquent and have this great speaking voice. And then the other ones get even more intimidated. And they're just less likely to share. So I was pretty darn excited about that experiment. And I am sticking with it. Yes, fear of public speaking is universal. But let me also share this with you. By the end of my class, nearly 80% of my students shared that they felt that their verbal skills improved in the class. 
because of the fact that they were required to speak. And let me show you one more thing. I had a student in my class who has taken 30 online classes and she's never once been required to speak. So something else I'm reflecting heavily on, I, get, I, I know I'm getting off topic here, but is this element of speaking in online classes, um, you know, and I, it's just, it's really fascinating. It's, if anyone's interested in talking to me more about that, reach out and let me know because it's something I'm thinking a lot about. Yeah, so VoiceThread doesn't offer free robust accounts for educators, but every, anyone can come on and create a free account on VoiceThread that is limited. Um, and it's limited to the, it's, it's, it has, it has full functionality, but it limits you to, to creating only three voice threads. So once you've created your third one, you're basically going to have to upgrade. And the, the, the options are different for higher ed and K-12, so I'm not going to get into that, but you can check out their site. Yeah, so Lori, reach out to me. Here's my email address. Thanks for sharing that, Peggy. Do we have any other questions? Michelle, we need to wrap up because we have two other sessions that have just started. Okay. Okay. Thank great. you so much. Thanks, everyone. It was awesome. Okay. Have a great have a great conference, everyone.